Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Um, this is the CAM Filmmaker Summit, Work From Home Edition, uh, and I'm Sapna, the Talent Development and Special Projects Manager here at CAM. First off, I'd like to thank our funder, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation for making all of our work possible. Um, I hope you were able to catch the two other sessions before this one, uh, and now it's time for our happy hour hangout. If we'd been in San Francisco altogether, we would have actually been sharing some food and <laughs> some beverages. And I do hope that we can gather together in person uh, in real time someday soon. Uh, but right now, please do take a minute to grab your favorite beverage and join the team from the landmark PBS series, Asian Americans, which just, which just premiered uh, this week on Monday and Tuesday. I'm personally really excited to hear their stories that, as I've been hearing a few snippets from uh, Don Young, our director of programs here at CAM. Please join me in welcoming Don. He's not only my boss, but he's also the series executive producer for Asian Americans. Don, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sapna and everybody. It's great to spend this day with you uh, on this wonderful Filmmaker Summit. It, these are such challenging and extenuating circumstances, but it's great to bring community together and spend some time uh, so I, uh, it is, um, so this, this week's been quite the whirlwind. I'm really uh, personally looking forward to today's conversation uh, before I'll go over format a little bit and uh, uh, what to expect. Uh, th this, this is meant to be a happy hour. So really, you know, we want to be aspirational and positive and inspired. And, you know, really this, this isn't about the series in regards to being a pinnacle, but rather how is the series a start of something? Hopefully we can reveal a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, bringing community together, what we all learned, what we would do differently, but, you know, more importantly, what this can seed in terms of all of the work that we do get together. Um, you know, it is uh, just some background on the series. You know, for those who, who haven't heard, the, the, this series was a partnership with WETA, the flagship station, PBS station, Washington, D.C. You know, it started way back in 2012, where Jeff Bieber, the executive producer there, had done a, a series of comprehensive seri uh, uh, history programs on the Latino Americans community, the Italian Americans and Jewish Americans, and he approached us and asked us to join with him. You know, at the time, uh, we were interested. Stephen Gong, executive director at CAM, really advocated for it. You know, from my perspective, it took a little bit of time to get, to be convinced because you know I'd certainly heard of at least three other projects that had been you know, mounted. My first uh, first job was with Lonnie Ding on Ancestors of the America. So on the one hand, you know, we certainly understood what it all could be and the gravity of the opportunity. But, you know, we really wanted to make sure that if we were going to be a part of it, that it was done right, done the good and right way. Right. So, you know, uh, now it's 2020. The show just uh, broadcast this week. You know, even as recent as a week ago, we really had no idea how the public was going to respond. You know, uh, picture had been locked probably in February. And then, of course, the world totally changed, right? COVID-19 came. Uh, the circumstances for Asian Americans shifted. And, you know, uh, in ways that I think we had never seen before, the Asian American experience became front and center in regards to uh, uh, questions about the American identity, race, American history. And we knew pretty quickly that the, the series was going to be one opportunity for the community to, to stake its claim in terms of history uh, in this really critical election year. Uh, so we uh, pivoted very quickly from what were going to be dozens of um, in-person events to, to digital, right? Um, but so, you know, briefly, the show's been 
the, the, the response has been incredible. Each of the episodes are going to get over 3 million viewers. There's been so much public engagement, press coverage. But, you know, for I've been at CAM since the mid 90s. And I've never, I don't think we've ever seen this opportunity for our community to be in this spotlight, uh, to be central to the conversations about race and equity and class in America, right? So I uh, am really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, this is really meant to be a happy hour. Uh, I, uh, on behalf of Cam, on behalf of somebody who's been doing this for a couple of decades, it's been an absolute privilege and honor. You know, I'm going to try to keep this conversation going as quickly as I can because we have three groups of really amazing uh, uh, folks. And um, please do send your questions over. I'll do my best to try to answer them and, and prod them. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to try to get out of the way. But, you know, uh, on behalf of Cam, uh, it's been an absolute honor to be part of this project. And we hope this is a valuable and useful conversation. And again, this is hopefully going to reveal some secrets in terms of what hopefully uh, everybody in this conversation and who's, who's all of the audience can really take this and run with it, right? That's, you know, the show is not really the end point, but I think it's a new, uh, uh, ho hopefully a new normal for our community, right? So, uh, uh, why don't I? Why don't we move um, to the first group? But just some real quick background: the, the the project started in 2012, and how how everything has changed in these last eight years, right? With Black Lives Matter, with Me Too, with Oscar So White, with starring John Cho, the the language in which we all used heading into this project. I was looking at some of my early emails, and we were bantering about and we thought, you know, initially that just being, you know, having an Asian American history was going to be important, but we had to early on really fight to be able to manage and be executives and design and mount this whole series, right? And I think, you know, with the rise of organizations like ADOC, Brown Girls Doc Mafia, Firelight, there's been this parallel evolution and assertion of our community that was really shaping our team front and center, right? So I think hopefully this conversation will really um, channel all of that momentum and great energy. So the, the conversation is going to be split into roughly three 20 minute uh, sections. The first three folks will be Yuri Chung, Renee Tajima Pena, and Jean Chen really the folks responsible for scaffolding the vision of the series. Uh, the second group will be uh, cinematographer Jerry Henry, uh, editor, writer Aldo Velasco, and editor Victoria Chalk. And, you know, they uh, don't necessarily come from this Asian American filmmaking community, but there's no question that the storytelling, the ambition, and I think the ethos of the series and the spirit really elevated because they joined our series. And then the third group will be, you know, the, a really distinguished um, group of filmmakers. And, you know, quite simply, you can hope and dream to create a great series. But if you don't have the filmmakers, it's all, you know, pipe dreams, right? So why don't we get started first with Yuri, um, Renee, uh, uh, and Jean. And then briefly, so Renee, I think folks know Renee Tajima Pena. Uh, I'm not going to do a lot of uh, intros because I want to keep this um, really about the conversation. I think everybody uh, will be able to um, find out who's who. It's such a distinguished crop. You can just look it up, right? Uh, so I wanted uh, first, if we could put um, uh, Yuri and Jean uh, and Renee up. I wanted, I asked Yuri to put up, give me some metrics, right? And I think this will be uh, a great primer in terms of the scope of this series, right? So I wish I could see the faces on the audience, but I will see the panels and this is gonna be quite entertaining. So some key metrics, 
that really, I think, will indicate the scope and vision and ambition of the series. Uh, five days of research shoots, not a big deal. But now we move into the big numbers. 67 shoot days, 80 interviewees, a field production staff of 57, 6,500 video and audio files logged in Airtable, 20,000, over 20,000 still photos logged, over 200 archival sources of licensed material, uh, 57 fair use archival sources, archival staff of 23, production staff of 24, eight advisors, um, and then this is the most enjoyable part, 14 staff with WIDA to work with in one EP, nine staff at CAM in one EP, two ITS staff in one EP, and then a finishing staff of 18. So, you know, I, I wanted to give folks a sense of the massive ambition of the construct of this series, but maybe starting with Yuri, folks who don't know Flash Cuts, this uh, uh, fabulous uh, post-production house in LA, uh, founded by Walt Louie, a former CAM board member. Why did you join this, Yuri? And I think initially, you know, we, we, we've worked together for many years, but what was your hope in terms of Flash Cuts being uh, joined in this project and you being an Asian American Studies scholar? What, why did you jump into this project? Uh, well, before I go there, I'm just gonna say that one statistic I forgot to send was that uh, when I went to shut down Slack, they told me we had 224,897 messages over the course of the show and had uploaded 21.8 gigs worth of files. That seems to be, uh, wow. I don't know, an insane number to me. And I would assume that about 80% of those were GIFs because at some point we just devolved into communicating with animated GIFs. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I can show you some of those that we custom made later. Um, I joined the, sh the show probably because it just made a lot of sense. Um, I came out of Asian American Studies at UCLA in 2005 uh, with my master's degree. I had moved here from Boston. Um, and while there is ethnic studies there, it is not a huge community. So I really came to UCLA with the intention of learning about Asian American studies and the kind of history that this, this series shows. Um, and was frankly just gonna move back and try to work in nonprofits and you mm -hmm. know in the Asian American community there. Um, I got sucked into visual communications <laughs> through Bob Nakamura's class. And it just made a lot of sense to me to like be in documentary and tell stories because that's mm -hmm. really what was most intriguing to me about my MA experience was hearing mm -hmm. all of these stories that I hadn't heard before. So sure. um, the fact that I could work at Flash Cuts with Walt Louis uh, like a pioneer, old school, <laughs> OG, Asian American studies uh, person who knows film and post-production backwards and forwards and how that kind of dovetails with my documentary and UCLA experience and Asian American studies degree. It was just sort of a weird, I don't know, I was uniquely situated <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to work on the show in a lot of ways. Right. So, so you, um, you worked with, I mean, you worked for Walt Louis, right? He founded your company and, you know, in many ways that, that handing over, you know, he, I'm sure in, in your early years really talked about, you know, Cam's founder, Lonnie Ding, right? He, you know, you all mm -hmm. have always been such a important supporter of our community, right? You know, you all have been a reliable house, but you know, you, um, I think are just like incredible worker bees who back the community, right? What, what did Walt tell you in terms of uh, before you flash cuts committed, like what, what, what were, why did you all like in terms of what the stories you heard about Lonnie and what this show could do for the community? Why, why did you jump in? I, I, I had actually, I take in undergrad. I had taken, two Asian American studies classes. I think there were only three offered and I'd taken the two that were available uh, when I was there. And we had seen Ancestors in the Americas. Um, 
And I guess I just didn't connect it to real, like a real person that had made it, you know, just like when you watch TV or films in the theater, like you don't connect it to actual beings who live on this mm -hmm. earth who make those things. And so when I started working with Wall and he was telling me and showing me like bean sprouts that Lonnie did <laughs> back mm -hmm. in the day. And um, I got to LA, I think, maybe within the year that Linda Mabalad had passed away also. And so mm. I was just pretty aware early on through visual communications that there was this community. And, you know, I would watch Bob Nakamura's films and he would show us like the early, uh, like canon of Asian American studies, films and history and just creative work. And I just mm -hmm. felt like, it just felt like home. And so, I don't know, I with Walt, it's kind of like, He's always been in the commercial world. He's always been like had one foot in sort of, for lack of a better phrase, the money making world, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. where we were actually able to sustain ourselves as a company because uh, of the commercial work we were doing. And then he would, and then we we just knew that we had the resources and the ability to house a project like this and also like give it the home that it needed in the time that was needed, I guess. Right, right. Well, so, you know, for the, with Yuri being the executive in charge, the way to put it, uh, if I frame these three in this part of the conversation, the um, uh, uh, Renee as series producer really provided the vision of the series. I think Flash Cuts was sort of the skeleton, right? If we're creating this Frankenstein, mon you know, being, bringing it to life, and then Gene, you know, uh, in, in our, you know, as one of the uh, executive producers, but really has redefined what a mentor and a leader and a team member can be uh, in documentary, uh, really provides sort of the heart and the brains of the operation. Uh, but we, to be clear, you know, Yuri, Flash Cuts was first one in, and then Flash Cuts was the last one out, right? We even had some adjustments to some of the promotional materials at about 1.30 this morning, right? So, <laughs> but why don't I move over to Gene? Gene, you know, um, you, it took us a little bit of convincing to bring you onto the series, you know, because in some ways, I think you understood the complexities of telling a dynamic story. But, you know, somehow a couple of years ago at Sundance, we met up and we were able to draw you in, right? What, 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 what were both your reservations in terms of working on a show like this? And then ultimately, what got you? How did we reel you in? Like, what, what was it? You know, you, you have such deep care and heart for community. Where did that switch happen? Well, let me go back to um, when I first heard about the project. It was 2012 March. Jeff Bieber mm. interviewed me in New York City as an editor. You know, I'm known to, to be an editor more than an executive producer. So, and after that conversation, I just didn't want to do this project because it was a white executive producer again. Mm -hmm. You know, in 19, 19, well, 1999, 2001, as we all know, um, there was another project um, by Bill Moyers. It was all white producers. And I was one of the, you know, editor they were interviewing, I didn't do that one. And I say, it took 20 years, it's, it's still uh, all white, you know, executives. So mm -hmm. I, I just didn't want to do it until well, I, when I heard, you know, Renee was going to be on, when Cam was going to be on, that did not take much convincing. It's when I know we're going to be, you know, holding this project to our heart. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, uh, how hard was the project? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that in a, in a complaining way, but like, you oh. know, these, these are hard, you know, these are hard, you know, I think we can all, th this last week has been really f gratifying because I, we've been reaching out to each other. And I think, you know, we wish the world hadn't turned like this, but to have work that matters, right. And to work and build community is meaningful but you know it's important also that we be honest about like these are hard projects right these are really hard to do 
Well, that was another reason why I didn't want to work on it because I know how hard <laughs> archival mm -hmm. historical docs are. I mean, I worked a couple of them and it's, people think it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's easier that's a script. Mm. It, it doesn't mean, you know, even though we, um, you know, Renee gave us the roadmap, mm -hmm. but we, we, just, we know that you have to go out and find the stories to fit into, you know, the, the premises. And I have to say, uh, a year ago, uh, John Els, who was the original producer for Eyes on the Price, mm -hmm. and when he found out I was the executive producer, one of the executive producers, he pulled me aside and said, if you think this is hard, think 10 times harder. Mm -hmm. I knew that, I, that was also, I, knew, I was ready, you know, I was ready. So actually, at the very beginning, for the first six months, I would say, I was just, you know, let everybody do their work. And, you know, we have the best team assembled, right? Mm -hmm. From everyone. And, and, you know, I mean, the, the picture you saw earlier, every single one of them is just the, the best. So I was just, you know, gonna, I'm gonna sit back. But then, you know, what was so hard? The schedule. Mm. And I, I felt that we always catching up mm -hmm. um, because we have a set broadcast date, 2020 May. Mm -hmm. And as you know, anything, any production goes, the window gets shorter and shorter and the difficulty just, you know, it's just expanded. And, but I have to say Yuri and, you know, just <laughs> you housed us, you know, it, 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 you, I, I felt that we've been protected in this house physically, but mm -hmm. we also been protected by our ancestors. Mm -hmm. You know, day one, uh, when we had our um, team meetings, the first time, all the staff meeting, and I just had to, you know, ask the answers to protect us because I knew mm -hmm. it was going to be hard. Mm -hmm. And also, I just want to go to, a, 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 a go off, just talk about Lonnie Dean a little bit. I'm an East Coast filmmaker. I didn't know who Lonnie Dean was. Mm -hmm. And when I was editing my first big, uh, historical doc at Blackside, Malcolm X Make a Plane. The film was not going well. I was on the verge of getting fired, you know, because just the film was not going well. They blame on the, the editors. And somehow we were invited to go to Flaherty Film Festival, um, 1993 summer. And we showed our first rough cut to the public. And there was this Asian American woman came up to me, gave me the biggest smile and just say how great it was. Actually, we had a standing mm. ovation from the rough cut. And that was Lonnie Dean. Mm. That was the first time and the last time I ever met her. Oh. And yeah, um, until actually when she passed away, I did go to the memorial in New York City. Mm. But it just shows when you talk about mentors, I mean, everybody has to get um, affirmation from someone, I think. I, you know, at that time, I didn't have the confidence, but mm. all these people gave me the confidence I needed. So when I took on this project, I, I just knew we we're going to be fine, but it was going to be hard, but we we're going to be safe mm. because we have the protection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and also we have the, there's a, I believe in integrity of purpose. Mm. Each one of us had an integrity of purpose to make this right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a little bit of historical background. So Lonnie, uh, my first job was with Lonnie. Grace also worked with Lonnie. She really has, you know, so she created uh, not what was not to, she was one of the co-founders of ITVS or the strategy by which the, the federal funds would be claimed for ITVS. She, you know, really was this generous, incredible leader uh, and then for those who are, may or may not know Eyes on the Prize, it was Henry Hampton. And, and I remember back in the uh, mid nineties, Lonnie late at night would be talking about, we need our own sort of black side productions, right? You know, uh, 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 an Asian American run organization or production company, right? Whereby, you know, from the top down, it was constructed to tell our stories, control that narrative. You know, and it's, it's taken 25 years to get to this point, right? Um, you know, and I think the idea of Eyes on the Prize was always a, a, a benchmark in terms of 
telling our history, claiming that story, but I think as importantly, creating a, a series of films that would have a dialogue with the general public, right? So Renee, uh, uh, you know, I think Renee, um, you know, we, it first started in 2012 where there was the conceptualization of the series. I'm curious looking with you, looking back, you know, it's been eight years since we, this, the, the idea of this started ruminating. I'm, you know, how, how does what's happened in just this past week really compare to the vision? And, and you know, you, you're somebody who's film like who killed Vincent Chin a series of us got into this work because of that that film I mean in, in many ways I view this moment as the end I'm telling people this series this moment feels like the end of the first act for our community right it's 40 years but we this was always one of the key goals of our community is to tell this comprehensive history so we can really dig deeper and push further what are your thoughts in terms of what what you initially wanted to conceive versus where we're at now? I mean, I always wanted to tell, you know, Toni Morrison talks about a master narrative that was written not by us. And so I always wanted to write the narrative from our point of view, but a documentary, a series is a living thing. So, you know, we all three, you mean Jeff and, and with researchers went through the development period but then once the family grew, once the filmmakers and um, everybody else on staff came on, then it just becomes its own, takes on a life of its own mm -hmm. um, in a really great way. I mean, ways like I never imagined. Um, but I, I wanted to, because this whole, this whole question of ancestors and generations is so important. I mean, we talk about Lanya like the godmother of Asian American documentary. We talk about Jean as anti-Jean. And um, when we, the first week, very first week of um, research, and it was just me, Yuri, uh, Lan Nguyen, and Jenna Hamamoto were like starting the office up. And the very first story we wanted to tell was we had this um, great home movie footage of a Filipino family from Stockton, the Mabalan family. And we knew that Don Mabalan was this incredible uh, historian of Filipino American studies. And she was really charismatic. And, you know, she, it, she was like, it was going to be perfect for us because their, the family had lived through such important history, um, including, you know, the, the formation of the, um, the farm worker movement. Um, she was a great character. She knew her stuff because she was a historian. And as soon as we were going to call her, we got this email that she had tragically died. I think mm -hmm. she's only about 40 years old. And I thought, I mean, we can't go on. Um, mm -hmm. But an interesting thing is just yesterday, I saw, saw people were posting we used the home movie footage and you know the uh, Vic and Leo edited episode three um, about it's a, the story of the 1950s and the family realized that two shots that we used from the home movie footage were Dawn. One was when she was a little girl wearing an angel costume and the other one was the very last shot in the episode of Dawn close up smiling into the camera. I was like, oh my oh, God. You know, talk wow. about looking down on us. Oh, I can't go on. Mm -hmm. So that's and and in terms of generations, I mean, we really drew from these scholars, Asian American scholars. We also drew from Asian American filmmakers, like episode one and you know, all the work Arthur Dong's done. Mm -hmm discovering like the Asian Americans in Hollywood, um, you know, so many, like so many stories that have been told on film by other filmmakers. I'm also in episode one, Frida Mox, uh, footage of Connie Young returning with her mother to Angel Island. I mean, you can't, and that was mm -hmm. in the 1970s, she filmed that. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of generations, what Don, what you, you talked about of how we're going to move forward. I mean, the one thing that happened in parallel with developing the series was the birth of ADOC. 
Yeah. And ADOC, um, you know, Leo Chang and Grace Lee, who are two, two of the producers on the series, um, they, in 2016, it's like the, the love child of a gay man and a married woman was ADOC. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. ADOC grew along with the series and the idea that these stories will continue to be told and we can all have a part uh, of mentoring emerging filmmakers and just, you know, kind of supporting more stories. It's, it's, it kind of helped because we knew we had five hours, as Grace pointed out, you know, country music, it's 13 hours. We got five to tell the story of all Asian Americans over 150 years. So we knew a lot would be left out, but then there are all these other Asian American filmmakers who can take on the stories and we can be a part of, you know, helping to make that happen. Great, great. So I'm um, uh, trying to, th thank you, Renee. Um, I'm trying to uh, keep us to time, but I would, if each of you, I'd love if you would, you know, this is supposed to be a happy hour. It's a, um, uh, what, I'm curious, like, could each of you do a toast, right? I mean, I, I you know, I, I'm not good at toast, but we could not have done the series without, you know, flash cuts and Yuri and, you know, literally housing us, but I think, you know, having that literal house f for us to go to, you know, for me, it, there were, it was hard at times, you know, really trying to reckon with what is the best show we could make. But secretly, I just always wanted to be down in LA because that's where all the magic was happening, right? So I, you know, want to really thank Yuri and Walt. Um, it was, you know, I mean, this, these projects and these opportunities to build community really are an exceptional experience, right? So, but I mean, uh, you know, you, Don, you started out with those metrics of all the huge staff and everybody who put it together. Because of the, we were delivering in mid-March because of the quarantine, it really came down to Yuri, like, mm -hmm. I, it was just you, right? With some help from Travis and Walt. I, I don't even know because things were just getting done and I knew Yuri was doing it. I, I had no idea how that was happening. But that's- uh, Travis, Travis did a lot. <laughs> I, I don't, it would not have gotten done if he hadn't been, because I just couldn't take care of all of the non-technical stuff and all of the paperwork and the emails and everything. So um, he basically conformed every single episode. I would have to go in and check things, but he, he got everything out of Avid into Premiere. We got everything up -resed and taken to our house. And uh, the show literally wouldn't have existed. Like we'd, I'd still be like overcutting footage probably today <laughs> if, wow. if, he wasn't, if he wasn't involved. So my okay. my my toast would be to my partner Travis Hatfield, non Asian American oh, yeah. from Indiana, who uh, yeah. held it together while I was having nervous breakdowns. And so. coronavirus, <laughs> coronavirus voice talent too, right? Too. <laughs> yes. Also the voice of your funding pod, thanking you for your viewership, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, because we had to record all of that uh, in our home <laughs> in the middle of lockdown. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So I'm still learning how to moderate these things. So I'm sorry. Uh, well, thank you, three of you. No, it's, I want to uh, toast to you. Actually, you. yes. Um, I want to toast to my co-executive producers. So back to Jeff Bieber, who I say no from day one. I actually want to toast to him. Mm -hmm. um, because actually without Jeff Bieber, this wouldn't have happened. So, mm -hmm. But also Don, he had turned great over the years <laughs> for this series. And Don is one of the most humble person and most dedicated person I know. I met Don in 1997 when I was working on Renee's My America. Um, and I tell you, toast to you, Don. Thank you. I, I, I say he looks very mild mannered, but in terms of fighting for the Asian American perspective, oh, it was, he was really scary. He was really scary. So that's, I think that's why we were able to tell the story from an Asian American perspective. Thank you. Don't look the cover of oh. the book. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you. I, so I, for those, this will be sort of a tour through 
Asian American history and we'll move on film. I, I was hired by Janice Sakamoto and I think there's a number of folks here who remember Jan and, you know, was my, my mentor and really taught me the right way, right? So thank you. So why don't we move on? So the next three is uh, uh, Jerry Henry, cinematographer, Aldo Velasco, uh, editor and writer, and Vic Victoria Chalk. And so, you know, um, we, you know, I think the series really benefited because there, you know, early on, these three folks were brought in. I believe Grace really pushed for Jerry and Aldo and you and Gene really pushed for, you know, uh, Vic. And I think the backstory is, you know, the team were really trying to make sure the DNA of our series was good and right. Right. So I think that we didn't want to be producing a series where we were just speaking to ourselves, but really elevate the storytelling. But I think more importantly, you know, figure out how this story could speak to different audiences in a very dynamic, creative, powerful way. So I am curious for each of you when you were solicited and, and recruited like what was your first response when, when people approached you, right? Like how did this, do you recall how the series first came to you? Maybe I'll start with Aldo, but like what, I'm curious for each of you, what's that first memory of this beast of a series coming into your life? Well, uh, I think that uh, there's always that question of, oh, uh, would it uh, make more sense to have an Asian American <laughs> editor? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do, I mean, I love working with Grace. I'd worked with her many times before and the project is so intriguing. And I knew, I love historical documentaries and uh, historical surveys in general. So I love working with archival footage. So I, I thought, uh, I was excited about it. I wanted in and I, I, I fought hard to, uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to get hired. Cause I, I, I met up with Jean in New York. I'd never met Jean mm -hmm. and that was fun. We met at the Malibu cafe or the Malibu diner. And I made in my York? pitch in New York, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then because Aldo, you come, you, you, you yourself are like a jack of all trades, you know, a writer, an editor, you do documentary, you do narrative, you, you, you're a filmmaker. You were once a private investigator, is that right? That is true. Technically true, yes, I was a private mm -hmm. investigator. Also well, a playwright. Too, yeah, also a playwright. I think, you know, when you headed into this, did you have a sense of, the stories, like the, the fluidity of, of the process and like what, I'm curious creatively, what was, where, where do you think you were, like, what, what was intriguing to you? What was well, I, I, I mean, the history itself was intriguing to me. I think what surprised me was that um, the amount of storytelling craft that is needed on a series like this, I, 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 it probably sounds obvious, but I think many people think that everything is kind of scripted ahead of time or it's just sort of somebody has figured it out and, and the editor and director just come in and plug in the holes. And it wasn't like that at all. I mean, it was mm -hmm. I, like Gene had mentioned that before that um, there are so many stories for one thing. You sort of feel like you're, you're surfing this massive ocean of story and you have to create a narrative out of that. The massive ocean of history and, and data and facts and footage, and you have to create a uh, a story, a legend, a, a a clear a song. I know that sounds that might sound corny, but that's kind of the way I thought of it. Mm -hmm. And working with Grace and and the rest of the team was amazing to to do that because that was um, a constant puzzle to figure out. We were constantly shifting and mm -hmm. changing until we arrived at the final product. Right. And then a series of this ambition in many ways. So it's five hours. It's meant to be one coherent series, but from research to writing to editing, it's almost as if there's a full process for multiple films, right? So it's, it's like films within a larger, multiple films within one large narrative, right? Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Certain segments could be their own short films. And, um, mm -hmm. and of course, there could have been, the series could have been 10 hours, 20 hours. There's, there's so much to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that was, that was one of the big frustrations of the series is that, uh, boy, we, we really could have had a 20-part series mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of the actual history to relay. Mm -hmm. And so in terms, and then so just as background, you edited episode four, episode two and episode four. And then additionally, you stayed on 
to help write, right? You did additional writing on uh, all the other episodes. But how did, you know, um, as, some, as a non-Asian American, like what do you think, how, how did you navigate that? I'm curious sort of politically, like when, was, did you always feel comfortable in the space or did, like how, what, what was your, like your internal thinking knowing, you know, like you said earlier, in many ways, I think politically, there could have been an argument that, o that the series should only be produced by Asian Americans. But I, you know, certainly having seen this, it's clear the series benefited because of the range of experiences and diversity. But like, how did you sort of navigate that creatively, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that um, you have to be sensitive, but also, I mean, everyone was very welcoming to me. I, I felt like there wasn't a lot of um, uh, pushback. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, I think the, the Latino aspect that, you know, like we, we did have, someone's just mentioning, we had a Latino corner. My assistant editor, Dennis Mendez, is Latino. And, and so we were, there's a lot of parallels in those stories, obviously. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of parallels in those histories. Uh, having another perspective is, I think, very beneficial just, just to, uh, to, to, to see it anew, to see it through different eyes. And, um, but, but ultimately, there, there are so many similarities and there, there's, so, there's a lot of coherence, a lot of shared strategies and a lot of shared histories. Um, in terms of working with the team, I, I, never, I never felt terribly self-conscious because um, mm -hmm. everyone was really open, very welcoming mm -hmm. from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, that just wasn't an issue. Now, had it been a different team, I might have felt more self-conscious. There might have been that kind of, uh, you know, overly uh, identity politicking kind of going on. But uh, it, it, was, it was extremely inclusive and supportive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one last question I'm curious as, uh, how, how did, do you feel this series fits into your journey as an artist, as a, as a creator? Like, what, what, what are you, I'm just curious. I, I think um, it, it really, I learned so much on this series and not just Asian American history. I, the history, of course, is the most important, but in terms of how you relay that history mm -hmm. is such an incredible experience for me. I, I've never worked on something so extensive that spans such historical reach and working with Grace and the rest of the team on that was an incredible journey for me. I, I learned so, I feel like I learned so much about um, storytelling in general, even though I, I, I felt I already knew something about it, but this, this was uh, it elevated it to another level. Mm -hmm. um, and also how, how to tell, this is really the, what, I, I don't think people have really mentioned this, but um, the original concept of the series uh, that Renee and then uh, the producers, Grace and, and uh, Leo especially, brought in was that, that, that this is a living history, that it's not just something in the past, that it's extremely relevant today. So all of those verite scenes that were shot in, in uh, our times, our contemporary times, mm -hmm. that, that wafted and wove their way. And that was another one of the delights and challenges of the series is to make those work seamlessly uh, in a product that was meant to be a historical survey mm -hmm. was, was a great challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, it was great having you on the series that you were, Aldo was, would always sing birthdays, birth, would, birthday serenades and great spirited <laughs> and, and creative and you know I think the the office and flat we really benefited and it was a pleasure to have you on the show so, oh, thank you yeah so why don't we it's clear I'm doing an incredible job following the questions but I'm gonna try to keep moving on to Jerry who Jerry and I have actually not met in person yet right so I'm not allowed on shoots right so um but Jerry I think the the crop um Jerry and Grace and Aldo come from UCLA, right? So you all have really a, are a generation together, isn't that right? Yeah, um, so Grace and I were at UCLA. We were in the same class. Um, we all, Aldo was a year, what was a year below us? No, a year above us. Um, but Grace and I came in the same year. Um, and I have to say that I've, I've uh, been working on every one of Grace's films since from, since film school. Actually, I worked on um, the first film we did together was uh, the Gracie Project, and then we did America Revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Every single project I've worked with Grace, so we've collaborated for 
mm-hmm. 20 years, which is just crazy. Mm-hmm. Like I haven't worked with anyone as long as I've worked with Grace. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when she asked me, it was a no brainer. I was like, of mm-hmm. course, you know, mm-hmm. uh, we've gone on so many of these journeys and we just, you know, when we're on site, we just, we just, it's just this natural energy. She trusts me so much. I trust her and we just, you know, we don't, we barely talk, but we just communicate. And, and mm-hmm. Yuri, at, you know, I had worked with Yuri on, on, a project with Grace, and so when they asked me, it was it was just no brainer. I mean, of course, I was like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I and I, you know, I I'm really busy as a, as a DP. I'm full time DP. I shoot uh, <laughs> lots of docs, and you know, just trying to carve out my schedule. I just made time. I was like, absolutely, I'll, I'm 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 in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, what was the first shoot that you did? I, and and sort of hand in hand aesthetically, I'm curious, like how, you know, obviously you shoot all the time and you've done, your, your breadth of work is exceptional, but how did you approach this project any differently knowing um, sort of the understanding the breadth of it and the gravity? I'm curious, sort of like creatively what was going through your head throughout the, the shoot process for the series? Well, you know, a lot of the documentaries I work on, <clears throat> I'm pr- I primarily, um, Verite, that's my strong mm-hmm. suit. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mostly Verite. And so coming into this uh, conversation with Grace and Leo and uh, Renee, we just really wanted something that felt contemporary, even though it was a historical piece. And so, mm-hmm. you know, just obviously there's lots of sit down interviews. And so what we, what we decided to do was um, <clears throat> all the spaces, that we used actually uh, were Airbnbs or, or places that weren't um, where our subjects. And so that it allowed us to have one central place mm-hmm. to do all the interviews. But the challenge for me was making, you know, one location look like three locations. So mm-hmm. they would send me pictures and I would be like, no, we, you know, this works, this works, this works, mm-hmm. but making it feel like it's not, something that's too that would be dated um so Mm -hmm. i like to use like um really fast lenses to have uh you know shallow depth of field but then also some of the um you know shooting in 4k obviously to keep it contemporary as well give Mm -hmm. them options in the edit but then also using the frame sizes so we'd go with these really wide frames and then we go with these intimate frames Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. the lighting was really natural so we wanted to make it feel and not be as obviously not to be as a distraction but you know all of the interviews are pretty much in daylight spaces because we shot everything during the day Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. the challenge within the winter is the sun goes down at six o'clock so Mm -hmm. having to start at a decent time where we can you know bang out three interviews in a day or or what have you um just making sure that everything was consistent so it was just constantly always trying to just make sure that folks look good. Um, And then there's the different, within everything, there's all the different skin tones as well, you know, and age ranges as well. So Mm -hmm. making sure that just people just look fresh, even though these interviews would go for, you know, hours. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, And then you meant, so we had this great back and forth in terms of after you watch the series with your family, right? And you, probably the most uh, asserted, passionate, you said, you know, this is just the beginning, right? Like you said, in your 15 years of being a, yeah. a cinematographer, that this is one of the most diverse, not, not just diverse in terms of communities of color, but also the majority of crew were women, right? I mean, it really, yeah. I, if you could speak to that, I think what is the, you know, like that framing that from your, you know, vast experience, like what, what, what did our set and, and what, what does this set and this show mean for the future and what you want to be a part of? Well, I mean, I mean, I think that's the thing that struck me and it's sort of kind of, I've, I've taken away from the series is mm-hmm. just, there was that picture that was, uh, I think it was like for an article for PBS and you just look at the crew mm-hmm. and I think everyone is, is, is a person of color and, and that never, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. And mm. usually when I walk on a set, I'm the only person of color, you know? Mm. Um, 
and then in to be in the position of the director of photography, you know, I, when I, I make a conscious effort to make sure that when I am selecting the crew that they represent, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, what, what the community should look like. And so just w every time you walk into the office, you just see just, you know, it's just all of these just powerful women and, and it's just important. I have a daughter that's, you know, she'll be 14 years old. And so mm -hmm. um, my wife, um, if, if, if people don't know, she's, she's Southeast Asian. Um, so my son, I have a son as well. He's 16. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another reason why this, the series was so um, important for me was, it was just being able to have something that I can share with them, you know, cause they are part of, of her and they're part of me. And so mm -hmm. that, that heritage is, is important. It's like you said, eyes and a prize. I mean, I grew up with that film. You know, that was the mm -hmm. film that 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 we would see. Uh, yeah, I remember when it came on PBS. And so having that, you know, everything is cyclical, right? And so having that experience again for them at this time when they're, you know, um, you know, the things that they're learning, it was just it was just monumental. Thank you very much. Yeah, obviously, every all, all everybody I talked about how from the tone you set to your incredible eye to, you know, th this set, you know, really, I think for Cam and for all of us, it's as important, the, the final product's important, but the community that we create and the generations that can really emerge, it's, it's uh, everybody seemed to want to go back out on shoots because of you leading those, you know, the visual yeah. side of those teams. So it's been, you know, we're, 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 we, we hope to be able to, screen the series together and actually meet in person sometimes <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah right. yeah no it's just it's just very you know it's 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 humbling to go to these places like when we were in louisiana and we just mm. like with a group of people and everyone's eating crawfish and it's very familiar to me i'm from the south i'm from houston and so that is a, it's very familiar like that felt very familiar but then knowing that there's this whole generation of people who came from you know these indian men that came to Louisiana. I mean, I never knew that story. I was like just blown away. And then when we went to Japan, I've been to Japan quite a few times, but going into the cemetery and I mean, there was just so many instances of that. And I, I just, you know, it's just this rich history that, I mean, I mean, it was just, we just kind of scratched the surface. I mean, there's so much more to tell, right? Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. So why don't we move to Vic, Victoria Chalk, the who edited episodes one and three. And as a uh, introduction, my daughter went down to a couple uh, to on set a couple of days and she described Vic as small but tough, right? So, and, and, and uh, Jean really early on wanted to bring Vic on. And I think you obviously, you know, it's not as if you hadn't done great work, you did call her Gonda already, but I think the the idea was to really invest in the future that you you know that 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 you would help tell a great story working with Leo but really you know it was very strategic to bring you on in terms of your fresh voice but also investing in the future I'm curious for you like what has this whole experience been right your your, your episodes were hard episodes one and three very heady you know the hierarchy of race right um what was the experience like for you, Vic? Um, I mean, it, just to echo everyone else, it was just so enriching and fun to go to work every day and be around an amazing team. Um, and you just kind of feel inspired by the team, but also, you know, by the material itself. And um, just following up on, on what Aldo said, I was really drawn to it because of the sort of intimate feel and the personal history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. leading into this, the broader picture of it all. And um, I don't know, I feel like I'm wearing my Memories to Light shirt today. And I feel that because episode three, we did use a lot of these home videos. I'm just hearing like Dawn's story, but also just so many people touched by the intimacy of the series and um, I think to edit something like that and find the balance between this like uh, we have to you know 150 years of history in five hours 
um, trying to represent the diversity of our own community. Um, me also, I guess, still even struggling sometimes with my own identity, like mm. biracial, Asian. I, I said to Anne and Yuri, like, am I American enough to be working on this? I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure that out. And it just, I don't know, I think everything just sort of ended up gelling together somehow. And um, mm. I think editing and story wise, it was such a puzzle across the five episodes, but also just within each scene. It's like, how much do we go into each story? When are we like too much in the weeds? Even if I want to go further with the story, it's not going to fit in an hour. And, mm -hmm. um, but I hope everyone can like see the potential in each story, you know, go make their own films, go research it on, on Twitter. There's so many threads of mm -hmm. accompanied reading for each story, which I, really really find amazing and um mm -hmm. I did I'm wearing this t-shirt actually because the I feel like the archival and the intimacy of this series has provoked so many conversations around me in the past like two days mm. um a friend of a friend reached out and, and was like oh I think I'm my great great grandfather is is this is um Toilet Goon's brother and I was like, what? And it's like, people feel so close to these stories still and are still discovering things. My mom wrote me a text message that was just so Asian. It said like, good job on show. I understand buddy Uno. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, like go further. And she just blurted out like a whole piece of family history that we had no idea of over like our, you know, WhatsApp chat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I just feel that um, people seem to be so in tune, whether it's with the footage itself in a lot of the home videos where we're presenting moments in the edit that are spe were and are special moments to that family in particular, like a trip to Disneyland, um, a trip to Mount Rushmore. And then we are in the edit sort of reframing that in the context of the episode, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're going deeper and we're questioning why that would be a special occasion for them. And then now we have this like third layer once everyone's seen it, which is like, oh, I recognize that moment, even if it's not my family, but I have something that's special like that. And how do I explore that? And how do I deepen um, the questioning around in my own family, my own heritage? And I think um, that's something I'll probably never get to experience on another documentary mm -hmm, as an editor. Mm -hmm. So. That's mm -hmm. been really special. Mm -hmm. How did you come to the series? Like, how was it, Gene? Like, how? When did you? I'm first just guessing. That? Like, Gene just whispered in someone's ear. I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, so you were talking about how your identity. You were always like, how, how, how has this affected your identity? I'm curious. Like, what, what, sort of the before and the after. What, 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 what has it expanded? Like, what, or has it not? I'm, I'm just curious strange because I grew up um, very isolated from an Asian community but my mom obviously mm. is Chinese Malay and mm. you experience the culture um, and it wasn't until and I, I'd lived like all kind of all over the world and it wasn't until I even moved to America that I realized that I was different I guess like I think on my first day at work I was in New York in like a post house and someone said to me hey uh, are you Harper and I was like oh, what oh. like what do you I don't know what that word means sorry mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about mm -hmm. and and then it became like this thing just like well Harper means this and then you know and I, I'm actually Harper too and like we can talk about it and then um so it, it really was moving to America that sort of opened up this community to me in a lot of ways and um, just made me more um, curious, I guess, about even my own identity and then was working through the medium that I work in with um, great directors and just trying to explore that side of me more and joining ADOC and working with them. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just feel a lot more comfortable with myself. I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. But it does make me want to make a series about um, Eurasians mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, 
the c colonial powers at will that were, were going on there. So something mm -hmm. to think about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was incredible having you on the show because it's like you were always asking those questions, right? I think this, this, this middle group, it really is about pushing that. How do we make sure that narrative can really, you know, speak beyond ourselves, right? I think that's, it, it's um, clear that's been what a lot of people have been responding, claiming, how can others claim Asian American history, so to speak? Right? So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I have to move, keep moving on um, to the, the filmmakers, but thank you very much, Aldo, Jerry, and Vic. Uh, and then now we'll go to the three filmmakers, right? It is uh, uh, astounding, right? Uh, to, to have, I've known actually Grace and Leo. Uh, Leo reminded me that we had no, we've known each other since 95. Um, and I think I met Grace shortly thereafter when, when she started working and, you know, um, and then Gita had known about for, for years. Um, uh, and I, it's been an absolute privilege to be able to have you three be the storytellers for the series. Right. But I'm, you know, each of you has different experiences as independent filmmakers, as directors for hire, being part of series, not being part of series, but I'm, you know, uh, for each of you, like, you know, uh, how was, you know, it's a challenging thing to come into a show. In some ways, there's a lot of limits, right? There were, the, the, the episodes were sort of set, it's a pan-Asian approach and it's history. What, what, what was both exciting and concerning about coming into this creatively. Maybe I'll start with Gita, right? Because you, you've you done, um, uh, as, a, as a distinguished editor, and then you, as a very distinguished director too, what was, you know, this was not a project that you necessarily, what, like three or four years ago, necessarily projected you would be a part of, right? You didn't, like- No, I mean, interestingly, I think for me, I also, I, I definitely, I've definitely done historical films that mm -hmm. um, involve narration, but I like Jerry, I think a lot of my films that I have made myself tend to be more verite. Um, and so this uh, format for me, I think, and Aldo, forgive me, I, you know, I'm not necessarily, um, I guess narration and was, is not my wheelhouse, which I think Don, we talked about when I came mm -hmm. on board. And mm -hmm. interesting, but what was really interesting and powerful about this project for me was that I can't, you know, I'm like Jean, you know, on the East Coast. And my experience, I think, you know, the film, everybody else was on the West Coast. And um, I, I had come up in film, but my mentor being the great Sam Pollard, I had worked on, on a lot of films that, and even the historical films I worked on were uh, predominantly about the African American community. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of, I have a, an expansive knowledge of, sort of, of that history and the history of struggle um, and triumph and, and the contributions, obviously, of the, that, of the community. Mm -hmm. Also, Spike Lee, where I came up with Spike Lee. But the, um, for me, I had never, ironically, even though I was deeply, I feel, embedded in the South Asian community here, um, in New York, you know, kind of, it, particularly in the, in the 90s, you know, was part of different activist groups and just um, Vivek Bald, who's in the film, is a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and DJ Reka, we have those folks in common. Um, I was part of the organization Sakhi here in, uh, in New York, but I am the South Asian Women's Creative Collective. So, but I had not, um, my world was limited um, in many ways. Again, I feel like I was, I, again, embedded and uh, had a lot of connectivity and solidarity with the African American community and then the South Asian community, but beyond that, mm -hmm. not much. So, not much experience and not much knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this was really an incredible experience for me being able to work with Grace Lee, who I, um, we were on part of a chicken and egg uh, year long program together. And, uh, and she, you know, we became really close and working with the rest of the team, I feel like I, I learned so much. And, and the, obviously the movement and the community on the West Coast, even though there's familiarity, there's also a great deal of differences. So it was really eye opening for me. 
um, to be part and of this. What are the differences? I, I'm curious, like this was, because in many ways it was constructed as a community production, right? It's like it was uh, folks who have been part of this filmmaking community, academics, but what, how would you describe what's different between what you've done before and, and this, this project, East Coast, West Coast, I'm just, how would well, you? I I think the communities, um, my experience, and this is, I speak only for my experience, sure. again, having been somewhat, like I said, I feel like embedded only within the South Asian community. I just, mm -hmm. I think the history of, um, of particularly of the, the Asian community, the Asian American community on the West Coast in some ways is much longer. You know, I mean, th there certainly were people here obviously on the East Coast, but from, in my experience, like South Asians, my parents are some of the, the earliest to come over on the East Coast who came over in the 60s as students. And, um, you know, after the certain, the Chinese Exclusion Act was opened up further, mm -hmm. um, after it was like finally in stages, right? It was revoked, but they came over during that, you know, sort of where, where, when they were looking for, for folks to fill certain jobs. Um, you know, my, fa they, my father came and studied over here and he came on the bottom of a boat through Ellis Island. So, um, so, so, so I find that the, the fascinating history and also the community and the, I think the organizing that took place on the West Coast sort of predates some of what I had, I knew of here on the East Coast. Like I was first gener, I'm first generation here. Mm -hmm. And, and again, all my, my parents were immigrants and every, but, but I feel like that idea, certainly it exists here too, but the, my knowledge of folks who had been here really since the 1800s, whose mm -hmm. ancestors had been here since the 1800s was much mm -hmm. more limited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, so you have obviously a, a huge, breadth of experience, both as an editor and a director, I, we were always struck by how efficiently, how, how smartly you could solve problems, right? Episode five it, being the last episode of the series, but it's also sort of the reckoning, right? There's such hard, big, you know, from the Vincent Chin movement to 9-11, LA uprisings, those are hard, historical stories like what was how did you put how did you manage navigating such honest tough history right like I, I, if you could walk us through some of the creative sure yeah sure so i think well i had of course i didn't do it alone i had mm -hmm. the you know the brilliant gene chen i had my co-producers who helped mm -hmm. i leaned on grace for particularly um for a section the section mm -hmm. on LA 92, um, and I had an incredible team. I had Shalise Haas, my story producer, who was who's really, really brilliant. Again, she is not uh, from the community, but just has such a sharp, you know, again, a sharp perception of things. And Alex Kuyper, who ultimately ended up being my editor here on mm -hmm. the East Coast, is also sort of, he's trained by me and Sam Pollard, so we have mm -hmm. a common language, and he's just fast and smart. But I think... Um, Again, the editing brain definitely helps. Like when you learn, I think I, the history to me of certain parts of the story, like Vincent Chin was completely new, but LA 92 was not, you know? So there, there were some things that I, I knew about and was more familiar with. But I think honestly, coming up with a Spike Lee and, you know, a Sam Pollard and some of the folks that I come up with, the, you, you, you want to tackle difficult subjects. You want mm -hmm. to talk about things like white supremacy mm -hmm. and you want to make bold statements and make mm -hmm. people uncomfortable. I mean, that was my mm -hmm. training. So mm -hmm. I'm a fan of, of that. And I think sometimes that might've rubbed up against, you know, some of the, you know, the maybe, you know, I, I know with Jeff, it was sometimes that was a challenging thing because Again, the idea of you want, you do want everyone to feel welcomed. Whereas my background is no, you want everybody to be uncomfortable and to go, not to be able to sleep the next night, you know? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so I think, okay. yeah, that's, but, but I do feel like I, again, it was every, I, I say this every time I talk about this series, it was like a master's, I, even though barely, but obviously you do much more work in it. But the idea of, I felt like I learned so much. You know, it was so much to absorb. Um, and that was that was super exciting for me. And I do feel, but the biggest complaint to you all has been that, 
you know, we end like there should be another, there should, it should have been six parts, right? Mm -hmm. Like everyone, it's interesting how the Asian, the Asian American Twitter feed was like, wait, you're going to leave us here? This is not enough. Where's the next hour? So mm -hmm. I guess it's better to leave people wanting more. Mm -hmm. That is very powerful though, where you come from the tradition of you go for those tough stories, you take hard history on honestly, directly. And I think that's of a huge benefit to that particular episode because it's like it was you know again we we really sort of the backstory was that's the reckoning episode so to speak but how can we take that head on and really come out of it so to speak right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. agreed yeah. yeah agreed all right thank you so i have <laughs> 15 minutes i have to move on to grace and leo try to um encapsulate this, but uh, Leo, can we talk? Um, you know, you are obviously one of the two co-founders of ADOC and, you know, you uh, very distinguished in terms of uh, filmmaker in our community, I think really uh, important, forceful leading voice, but you haven't done a lot of history, right? So and you had two really tough episodes, right? Not, not only are you leading the series, but they were really almost like the, the one and three are almost like four to five films per episode. Is that right? It feels like it, right? But what was it like jumping into telling such hard racial, you know, the, it's the construct of race, those two episodes by and large, right? Um, I, I, I felt like I, uh, I basically did one of those like, uh, you know, one year master's program that's supposed to be three years long. Um, you know, I, I think that unlike a lot of my colleagues who have um, much more knowledge of, of uh, Asian American history, I really didn't. You know, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant from Taiwan. I came to this uh, not so much as an activist, uh, but definitely uh, from the, the desire to, you know, become a filmmaker. Um, and uh, uh, I have clearly made work prior that has a lot to do with Asian American history, but, mm -hmm. but in terms of a comprehensive knowledge of Asian American history, I had so little. That's not um, your starting point, sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, so um, but I was fascinated by the, you know, by the dynamics in, in episodes one and three. You know, it's just, there was a lot to, to untangle and, um, or, is that the right word? Uh, Distangle, um, and and uh, uh, you know, uh, Vic and I, uh, we really work very hard to figure out, you know, because we have all these stories, and and Kate, our co-producer, you know, did a fantastic job um, pulling together these shoots, and 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 did did a lot of work in the casting side, um, but they were basically these short films that in many ways don't have a whole lot to do with each other, but we need to find these unifying themes to, to you know, connect these little pieces and then have the, uh, the episodes themselves connect to the, the larger narrative um, you know, that, that Renee um, had been envisioning and, and, you know, and conceiving. So, um, yeah, I, I don't even know really how to describe the process. It's just, there was a lot of um, discussion. Um, I knew that, uh, you know, pretty early on, we talked about episode one being about race, you know, mm -hmm. but race mm -hmm. from the Asian American perspective, but specifically about how Asian Americans um, muddy place on this hierarchy of race. You know, I think that especially compared to a, a community like African-American community and Asian-Americans are just, it, uh, the community kind of resides all along this spectrum of race in a really unusual way. And we wanted to tease that out. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. but, but three is a different story. Three for, for us, it was a transitional um, episode. It was the episode where we went from, you know, sort of this time period that that all of us see as like you know history to a time period where most of us consider to be modern, um, sure. and I think that that transition oh, oh. Uh, for us was was, a, was the big um, um, big lift for that episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, I want to point out that Vic actually became uh, an American citizen during the production of mm. of the series. So I don't know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I think that it's a sort of a landmark uh, series in many ways. Also. Mm -hmm. in a lot of personal lives. 
Absolutely, yeah. And I think what is really powerful about the series is that, you know, it totally uh, was really informed by the creation of ADOC, you and Grace. But like, if you could speak to that, like the, you know, we've talked about flash cuts, but, you know, really, what what does this series mean in regards to our filmmaking community building generations, right? Asserting a voice, right? Like what, how, how, what's your observations in terms of how this fits into that larger movement, right? Um, for me, the series feels like, um, you know, a couple of folks mentioning the idea of a bridge. Um, mm -hmm. We've used material, um, you know, footage from filmmakers from a generation above me, above us, you know, Arthur, Frida, uh, you know, Renee, and even Mark Harris, who is our consulting yeah. producer. Um, yeah. got, you know, he, he, those folks generated the archival footage for us. Um, and then to be able to then now have the series and hopefully motivate and inspire the, the, the younger generation of Asian American filmmakers to take these stories and make it into, you know, bigger pieces or or come in and say, hey, you know, there's this one uh, story that that was, you know, touched on, but didn't, you know, wasn't really uh, explored fully or was left out, you know, like Gita was saying, we, we mm -hmm. had to leave out so much. Um, we want to encourage folks to come on in and, and tell those stories and fill the holes. Um, and, you know, we're, we're excited that, um, you know, I, I really don't see this necessarily as the the definitive or the comprehensive mm -hmm. um, history uh, for Asian American. I think that this is just really the beginning. I think you had mentioned that at the, mm -hmm. at the top of the, the discussion. So, um, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm looking forward to all the great works that will come out of um, mm -hmm. this series and then come out of the work that we all are doing in ADOC you know, to support the younger generation um, of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly hope this will unlock you know, almost free up the other sorts of stories. You know, we, in the last couple of days, people have been really excited, but everybody wants to see more stories, right? The hunger is there. I think it's it's an initial uh, staking a claim, but but uh, we're, uh, how, I, th I think for you, so how does this, you know, you, you've done international work, you're executive producing a lot more now, your distinguished filmmaker, how does this fit into what you're trying, what you would like to do as, you know, as an artist? I'm curious, like, what, 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 what how does this, because you've seen this kind of big of a beast project, what, how does this inform your future? Well, I, it, 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 this is very much a, a very unusual project um, for me to be involved in. This is not um, my instinctive style of filmmaking, um, but I, when I have been hearing that the, the series is starting up, I really wanted to be a part of it. I felt like, um, I, I just knew in my gut that this was something that I just needed to be a part of. You know, it felt like uh, a, a, a special um, project that I will regret if I don't somehow get myself <laughs> onto the project. Um, you know, I, I think that for me more and more, I, I really am, um, embracing much more than, than early on in my career, the transnational side of myself, um, being an immigrant, um, being, you know, uh, splitting my life on both sides of the Pacific. I, my work now reflect much more of that. Um, I think that this, you know, to me is a, a fantastic uh, lesson, um, fantastic experience. Uh, you know, I had mentioned sort of learning about Asian American history, but now I, I also have a uh, uh, much more knowledge about how to put together something like this, a, a larger uh, comprehensive project, uh, you know, with many partners and, and with many collaborators. Um, you know, I would love to explore maybe, you know, some of the other subject matters I'm interested in, um, in this format. Uh, I, I am, right now my goal is to continue to, to do projects both here in Asia. I'm, I'm in Taipei right now, it's mm -hmm. 7 mm -hmm. a.m. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and uh, also back in the U.S. where a lot of my career uh, was built and a lot of my connections are. So um, it, it's exciting times and, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I, I don't even really know 
you know, what's coming down the pike for myself. All right. Thanks, Leo. Thank you. And then Grace, uh, so I, uh, you've already done other sessions today. I, I, in my longstanding guesstimation, I think you're the, you're, you're our heir to Lonnie Ding. I, we want to keep <laughs> pushing you to keep making film, that much, these ambitious films and series and lead, you know, I, I, um, your, your curiosity and passion about history. And I don't know how you did this, this series on top of actually leading, well, co-leading your own other series, but you know, you, 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 do I recall correctly, you left New York to work with Lonnie, isn't that right? Is, is that yes. part of the Well, I, there are other reasons to leave New York, but I left mm -hmm. um, to go work for Lonnie Ding as an associate producer on the Ancestor series. So in many ways, working on this project has been full circle on so many levels, including working with you, Don. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I see that people, a lot of people have asked questions about like, what did you leave out, you know? And one of the things that excited me about this series was even though I knew it was five hours, I sort of having been seeing what happened to Lonnie, just, you know, making films for a while, always understanding that this is not the definitive Asian American, sure. whatever, right? Like, what can we do with five hours? What can we, how can we, you know, sort of whet the appetite for people to, you know, get engrossed in these incredible stories. And then like Leo said, like move forward and like have the people who are essential storytellers to these other stories that we weren't able to tell, get them to be made. You know, hopefully if this one is successful and I think it will be, you know, there'll be a much greater opportunity and access for people down the line, you know, like the, the 25 years ago, me and you, Don, like these people are now, you know, thinking about, well, they didn't tell our story, tell your own story, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, I found myself the last week thinking a lot about Lonnie and other, you know, folks who really help create our community. What, what, what do you, what, what do you think? How, how do you think Lonnie will respond to this moment? And I think hand in hand, the last comment is like, where, where do we go from here? I mean, what, what are your, what's your thinking about what's possible from this point on? I mean, I think Lonnie would be ecstatic because I think, you know, I mean, she's, look at how many times she's been mentioned in, in this happy hour. I mean, it's, it's her legacy lives on. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I think a lot about this having done episode four, which is about the birth of the movement and thinking mm -hmm. about all those 19, 20 year olds who like struck for Asian American studies, ethnic studies in San Francisco state. And then how that inspired like the Viet Thanh winds and the ham trends to like tell their own story like a generation later. And then, you know, to go to those guys who are working in the 90s or Yuri's, you know, contemporaries in UCLA started the Roots program. And I feel like that's the thing that, you know, we don't know what it's going to evolve to. It's just going to be something different. It's going to sort of be in, it's going to encompass all of the history before. Like if we're, if we're paying attention and we're, you know, like learning from the history and will evolve into something much more, you know, like Viet says, like a new story that we don't even know about yet. And that's what's mm -hmm. super exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was very powerful, both that the, the filmmaking team, flash cuts, uh, the, the executives, but also all the folks who were, you know, Dano De Kim, right, when he stood up uh, on uh, uh, in relation to Hawaii Five-O, Viet Tan Nguyen, it, it was, it's, it's jaw-dropping to think of the collection of people all around this project who we, we had the, you know, absolute pleasure to be able to work together with, right? So um, I would like to, so I said I would try to wrap this up by uh, 4.28. Jerry has a, Jerry Henry has a doppelganger <laughs> game that he would like to close this out with. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, give it back to Sapna. But I, it, it's, this, it feels like I've been trying to catch up with the conversation. But again, you know, on behalf of Cam, uh, 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 it, it has been a, an immense privilege to be a part of this project. And the, uh, the nine folks in this conversation are only a very smart of the small part of the giant community 
who we were relied on for this series. And then again, as, as Gene mentioned, our partner at, at WTA. So it's been uh, an absolute highlight of my life. So uh, Jerry, do you want to take over uh, uh, with your <laughs> doppelganger game? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and share the screen. Can everyone see my screen? Hold on one second. Okay, there we go. So when we were on set, uh, we you know, because we're just up yet, Jerry. Let's go ahead and. Oh no! Click oh, you want to put it right there? Right mm -hmm. there? Oh, did I? Oh, hold on one second. There we go. Do you see it now? There we go. Now there yeah, we go. You pull it up. So when we were on um, set, uh, because we're looking at people's faces so much. We, we started this little game. Well, actually, I just sent this picture to um, Yuri. I would take a picture of the screen who, and I'm like, this person looks like, you know, they have a doppelganger. So this was the very first one. And uh, this is who I said that he looked like. This is Phil Cuddy. Uh, I'll own. Could you guys see the resemblance? But Yuri, she, she debated me on that. And so she said, Jeff Bridges. And I was like, no way. And so then it just started this text chain. And then we would just, every time we would see, you know, I would start the game and then everyone would just kind of jump in. The next person was uh, Alex Favros. And, and so then I immediately started it and I said, well, he looks like Danny DeVito. Um, and then Rowena, um, no, I think Yuri said, no, he doesn't look like Danny DeVito. This is who she said. Uh, that this is Yuri's pick. And then Rowena, um, she, she was like, no, this is who he looks like. So it was just amazing to kind of to see everyone's kind of take. Um, the last, one of the, the next ones I saw was, um, this is probably my favorite one, and this is Vivek. And immediately when I saw him, I was like, oh man, he, he looks like Jon Stewart. <laughs> and so we sent this around and I mean, look at, I mean, the, the resemblance is just kind of just crazy. And so then Serena, the AC was like, well, watch this. So she found, you know, she took that picture of him. I don't know how she got that picture. And then she, this was her, um, she put these side by side and we were just cracking up. I was like, oh my God, the same face. And then um, this is Wendy Mink. And I immediately said, oh, I know who she looks like. Kathy Bates. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what I would try to do is find pictures where people were wearing like similar glasses or anything. But I mean, they, and, and they fought me on this one. They were like, no way. She doesn't look nothing like her. And then, you know, th even in the crew, there was no one that was, uh, you know, people try to give me a doppelganger, but I just knocked it down immediately. I was like, no, no one looks like me. Uh, this is our sound mixer in, in San Francisco. I worked with Adriano actually on another couple projects and, and I actually noticed this a while before, but he looks like Mark Riley from, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is in Canny how, um, you know, how he looks like him. And then the last one, which is probably my favorite one is Yuri. So we were actually in Chicago on Gita shoot and uh, I was just going to the bathroom. Actually, I was just walking down the hallway and I just looked, it was like, this picture of like all these students on the wall. I don't remember what it was for, but this is Yuri's doppelganger, baby Yuri. And so I sent this to <laughs> Yuri immediately and she was like, no, that looks nothing like me, but I, I, I beg to differ. So that's kind of, that it was just a fun thing that we would do. And we just kind of would pick everyone. Um, I mean, there's plenty, there's more of them, but these were sort of kind of my, my favorite ones. And that was our little game just cause, you know, just had to keep it fun. That's it. <laughs> and that is how you work hard and build community, right? So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So That's awesome. Great. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope we can continue to do these conversations. And again, it was a, a pleasure and we should all be proud. And hopefully we do more of these with everybody else starting their own major projects. And this is just a start, right? Yes. Thank you. So back to Sapna. Is it back to Sapna? Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, everyone on the Asian Americans team. That was a wonderful um, behind the scenes look.